the enderpole oscillator. And um, if I look at it in time, it kind of looks like this. So it doesn't look too bad, although we can see that it's not like, definitely it's not like a sine or a cosine, right? But it's like a periodic signal, but like a linear system, if you saw a periodic signal, it would definitely be a sine or a cosine in a linear system. But in these nonlinear systems, you can see kind of strange shapes like this. So if we look at the face portrait, or in face space, if we looked at that, looks like this. So it has this initial condition. And you can see that it's actually going towards this limit cycle. So it's called the limit cycle. And then it just continues on that limit cycle forever. So it continues doing the limit cycle. Um, the limit cycle is a strange shape. So you can see one glance at this, and you can see it's not a, not a linear system. So linear, there's no such thing as limit cycles in linear systems. Um, so this is kind of a strange phenomenon. The only thing you could see in a linear system, you could see like a perfect circle, but not some strange shape like this. Um, so if I do the phase portrait, it turns out that um, anywhere that I start, anywhere that I start, I'm going to end up on this limit cycle. Um, now, this is only second order system, so I don't have any chaotic behavior. So like I said before, if I, if I go up and introduce like a third order system or fourth order system, I could have chaotic behavior. And in chaotic behavior, you can have uh, more than one limit cycle, and you can switch between those limit cycles. So I can go on one limit cycle for a while, and then switch over to the other one, and then switch back to the first one. And you can't predict when it's going to make those switches. So. Like a good example is just the double pendulum. So if I just have like, like my arm is a chaotic system. So, um, you know, they used to have these set up in science centers when science centers used to actually have real science experiments. They just have like two pieces of wood connected to each other on a wall and you could just go up and spin it. And you can see this chaotic behavior. So basically one mode was like, you know, this, this arm would like be moving really slowly and this one would be like spinning really fast. So this one would be kind of fast, and this would be spinning really, this one would be slow, and this one would be spinning really fast. And then it would go into another state where it was basically just doing this, you know, and then it would switch between those two modes, basically at random, because really chaotic behavior you can't predict when it's going to switch between those two modes. So it kind of gets really interesting when you get more than a second order system, because you can have this chaotic behavior. So. Um, we don't get into that too much because, you know, we're, this is basically a nonlinear control systems course where, you know, we're assuming we design a really good control system, we're not going to get into the realm of chaotic behavior usually. Although, it's a strange thing. Some people have actually used this idea of chaos in control systems where you could, you know, if I was trying to, like, let's say I wanted to like have a pendulum, double pendulum, and I wanted to like balance it straight up in the air, but I didn't actually have enough control torque in my arms to get it up there. Like I couldn't just do a straight lift because my motors weren't actually powerful enough. So what I could do is I could take advantage of that chaotic behavior and just kind of uh, cancel out friction with my actuators uh, and then just let the system kind of go into this chaotic mode. And then eventually I could say by the law of probability, eventually I'm gonna go through that state where I'm straight up in the air. And then my motors could just capture that. So I could just like, they'd have enough torque to actually like, stop me there. So I could actually take advantage of chaos in a control system in an extreme situation like that. I'm not sure if there's any practical use for that, but I've definitely seen papers that have done that as kind of a toy problem. So eventually someone might have a real good use for that. But I, I'm not sure if there's any, any practical applications for these kind of chaotic controllers as of yet. Um,
So let's just, since I said the word limit cycle, let's just define what a limit cycle is. Because we do see them in nonlinear systems. Green one might not work. A limit cycle is a closed loop, close or close trajectory in the state plane such that no other. Closed trajectory can be found close to. Uh, can you read the green very well? Or should I switch back to what do you think? Can you see it on the video? The green's okay? Yeah. All right. Well, if no one's complaining, I'll stick the green for a while. So, let's just take a step back here and just discuss the differences between linear systems and nonlinear systems. Linear systems have one equilibrium point, and nonlinear systems possibly have multiple equilibrium points. In linear systems, you can't have uh, finite escape time. Nonlinear systems you can have finite escape time. So basically anything can happen in a nonlinear system. So you could have something escaping to infinity and finite time. In a, non a linear system, this is always you know, it's always an exponential function when you talk about a linear system. Um, but with nonlinear systems, not necessarily an exponential function anymore. So in linear systems, you have no pure oscillations unless the eigenvalues exactly on the imaginary axis. Um, whereas in nonlinear systems, we can have limit cycles. can return to a certain state periodically. Uh, a linear system has only periodic oscillations. talking about a nice sinusoid or something. A nonlinear system can have non-periodic oscillations. So it could start off really fast and then we kind of go into some kind of slow oscillation. Uh, since we're talking about flexible joint robots in this course, uh, this is exactly what you see when the, uh, like the Canada arm lets go of a satellite and kind of like waves around 
it'll start off waving really fast and then it'll just slow down because it's such a highly nonlinear system. So this is actually, you know, you see this in the real world quite a bit. Um, linear systems are predictable. Deterministic. Nonlinear systems can have chaos. So, in this case, behavior cannot be predicted. Because of sensitivity to initial conditions. It's referred to as the butterfly effect. I've heard that term before. Um, linear systems, I could probably fit this in. Linear systems behave one way. Nonlinear systems um, can flip between uh, limit cycles. Unpredictably. So, so our kind of options for controlling nonlinear systems uh, would be one, which would probably be the first thing you would try if you're unsure, is linearize and design a linear control. And if you did that and the performance wasn't satisfactory, um, then you would probably want to look at designing a nonlinear control. So we talked about linearization before, but now that we're talking about control systems, we better address linearizing when there are control inputs. It just looks slightly different because we treat control input u differently than we do the state so we can keep track of it. So now we write that we have x dot equals f of x and u rather than just f of x. F of x. From now on, we're thinking whenever we write something like like that, we're always thinking, you know, we're the designers of U, so we're, you know, thinking about how we can design U as the control designer to get to this, the system to do what we want. So x could be vector. Let's say it's x1, x2, or sorry, x1. I'm just going to do a general vector. So do x1 all the way down to xn. And then we'll have the same number of control inputs as states to make things easy. Obviously, in more general kinds of systems, the number of control inputs can be different than the amount of states. That gets trickier. So we'll just talk about the simple case for now. So the equilibrium point is x equals x star, and u equals u star. So we would have x dot equals f of x star and u star plus di f di x evaluated at x equals x star and u equals u star x minus x star plus di f di x or di f di u evaluated at x equals x star and u equals u star times u minus u star 
plus higher order terms. of an equilibrium point, we have f at x star and u star is equal to zero. The linear system is d by dt delta x equals a delta, a delta x plus b to U. example. Um, so now we have an additional term in the pendulum dynamics. K through U, so I'm assuming probably most likely the pendulum um, has an electric motor at the joint, so I could produce a torque with that electric motor. It's probably the most obvious way to control the system. And then I could evaluate what K3 is, some constant that depends on <clears throat> the mass of the system. Um, and the length of the pendulum. So basically K3 is really, is really the inertia of the system. So it's U star equals zero at theta equals zero, or theta equals pi. There is uh, no difference. From the last example, So kind of nothing changes in that case, so we already have information design control for straight up or for balancing. Because uh, that's basically exactly what we did before. So it's really no nothing to uh, add for that. But what if we want the pendulum to stick straight out? That's when we get uh, a non-zero value for u star. So u star will actually have to be the amount of torque that it takes to have the pendulum stick straight out and overcome gravity. So, what if we want x1 equals pi over 2 and x2 equals 0 as our control goal? Um, and we're going to apply a nonlinear control. constant and uf is yet to be designed and probably will be a linear feedback control or at least 
because that's what I would try first. For some reason, my linear feedback control isn't sufficient, then I might re-examine that, but most likely I would just try a linear feedback. Um, so note that U star could be called uh, the feed forward term. It would be a term that we could use to uh, describe U star rather than equilibrium torque. It's not usually used in control systems. Now E star can be called the feed forward term. Uh, so a feed forward term doesn't necessarily have to be constant, although in this case the feed forward term is constant. Uh, if the feed forward term, a feed forward term could also depend on a desired coordinates. So if I had a desired trajectory. I could calculate a feed forward term based on the desired trajectory. But if I was calculating something based on the actual measured coordinates, by definition, that's not feed forward, it's always feed back. So feed forward could be constant term or depend on desired coordinates, and then it's a feed forward term. So then, in this case, we got x1 dot equals x2, x2 dot equals negative k1 sine x1 minus k2 x2 plus k1 sine pi over 2 plus k3 uf has an equilibrium point at x1 equals pi over 2, x2 equals 0, uf equals 0. So again, we could do this, kind of, this change of coordinates if we really wanted to uh, make sure we had uh, the equilibrium point at the origin, which we should probably do if we want to treat it as a linear system in our design. So just make the equilibrium point up here at the origin. Do a change of variables. Z1 equals x1 minus pi over 2. Z2 equals x2. And I have system Z1 dot equals Z2. And Z2 dot equals minus k1 sine Z1 plus pi over 2 minus k2 z2 plus k1 sine pi over 2 plus k3 uf. So now I'm in this place where I could just easily uh, linearize this system about z equals 0 and design Based on a linear system, I could design a linear control UF using all my linear control techniques. Does anyone have any questions about linear, nonlinear systems, linearization, pendulum, how you approach control design for using linearization? This, this should really be like the first lecture in the undergrad linear control systems course, right? Like you get to this point and you say, now you can see why we're, we can design linear control systems <laughs> for real systems that aren't linear. But uh, they just kind of skip over that whole thing. Undergrad control is a 
assume we can, we're justified in designing linear controls. Let's see how we do it. <laughs> we skip over the whole justification part. So this is the justification for why you can design linear controls for a highly nonlinear system, how to go about it. Um, but if it fails, that's why that's where we're going to have to look at nonlinear controls. So you might do this and try it out. And yeah, if you're if you just want your pendulum to stick straight out, then doing this uh, solution here with a linear control designed for UF will probably do the trick because um, you're not um, going to really encounter any large nonlinearities. But if you want your pendulum to do something more interesting, like some movements in space, following some precise path, you're probably going to have to go to a nonlinear control. So now I'm going to get into, and I'm kind of assuming you know how to. I'm not going to cover. Like, I'm saying you could you could design a, U, a linear control a UF here. So I'm kind of assuming you know how to do that already, based on your undergraduate knowledge. So we won't cover any methods for designing a linear part there. I'm just kind of assuming you know that already. Um, so now we want to get into nonlinear control. And nonlinear control is a little bit mathematical in nature. So unfortunately, I have to kind of define a bunch of terms first before I can really give you theorems about nonlinear control. So they use a bunch of technical terms, and technically, we should actually know what they mean in a precise way before we, you know, throw up a theorem that has these terms in it. So. It's not necessarily clear where I'm going with this for the next little bit of the lecture, but it will become clear later on when I start using these terms. And these are the kind of things you'll be tested on in your quiz two weeks from now. So I'm not necessarily covering everything in the lectures that you need to know for the quiz. You need to know everything in those appendices for the quiz. Um, I won't cover everything in the lectures. So um, just be aware, you're kind of on your own for for uh, studying for the quiz. So some notes on continuity of functions is what I want to address first. So a definition of function, f that maps a subset of the real numbers to the real numbers. Continuous at a point x naught that's in S one if the limit as x goes to x naught of f of x is equal to f of x naught or if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists some delta that's a function of epsilon and x naught, such that, let's do it over here. such that uh, x minus x naught magnitude uh, stays less than, or is less than, delta will imply that the magnitude of f of x minus f of x naught remains less than this number of epsilon. This is typically the way definitions are written in the world of mathematics. So the way to think of this is kind of like a dialogue or a challenge. <clears throat> so, so it says for every epsilon greater than zero. So think of this as being um, really implying no matter how small epsilon is. 
So the idea is epsilon is a small number. Um, and think of it as a dialogue, so you're challenging me. So you're, you're saying, hmm, I'm thinking of a number in my head, a really small number, epsilon, and it's 0 0.001. And you give that to me, and then, hmm, I can go off and I'm able to calculate delta based on your epsilon and the value of x naught we're talking about, such that if I pick x close enough to x naught within this delta, that I will meet your challenge and f of x will indeed end up being within epsilon of f of x naught. And then you go back and say, oh yeah, what about 0 0.0001? And then I go and calculate a new delta, and I confirm that, in fact, for your new challenge of 0 0.0001, I can indeed pick x close enough to x naught that I meet your 0 0.0001 challenge. And then you go back and get an even smaller number. No matter how small a number you pick, as long as it's greater than zero, uh, this kind of goes on forever. It's not a really fun game, but <laughs> I can always pick a delta such that I can meet your challenge and make sure that f of x is within epsilon of f of x naught. If I pick these, you know, x and x naught close enough together. So that's the way to think of these kind of mathematical definitions when you see it's epsilon greater than zero. You think of it as like a dialogue or a challenge that just goes on forever. And you're always picking a number small enough to try and win the challenge, but you never do. The professor always wins. So, so that's continuous at a point, but if I just say it's continuous, subset of the real numbers into the real numbers is uniformly continuous on S if for every epsilon greater than zero 